And uh, if you have a Bible, it would be helpful to have Nehemiah chapter 11 open. Uh, last week, um, after morning worship and after preaching from Nehemiah chapter 10, uh, someone said to me, um, Dad, <laughs> which narrows it down to two, um, do we have to read all those hard to pronounce Bible names on a Sunday morning? And uh, no doubt Luke wasn't the only one with that, uh, with that question in his mind. So my threefold response to, uh, to you is this. Number one, the Apostle Paul says that all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. Do you know that verse? Really important verse. The whole of the Bible, old, new, narrative, law, prophecy letter, all of it is, 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 is not only God-breathed, but it's profitable for us, useful for us. So God has placed these names in these books, Old Testament books, for our profit. In the second place, I would say, if we were Chinese or Russian speakers, a long list of English surnames, such as Bonneville, Dankworth, I hope there's none of these here, I tried to choose ones that were not. Lauti, Nithercott, and McCoy, they'd all sound just as discordant to the ear if we were Chinese. Is that right? So let's learn to be globally considerate. I've made that one up. But most of all, brothers and sisters, every single one of those names represents a real person. A real person like you, like me, with all their sorrows and their joys, uh, their lives lived, and most importantly, each one of those names represents someone who belonged to God's old covenant community, who had come to settle in Jerusalem to create a brand new community of his people. I, I thought to myself, really, what, what it's like, it's like reading that out. Do you know, do you know have, you, have you had one of those, the Manor Park directory, a new one's coming out? That, what we've just read there is like reading out all the people, all of you guys, all your names that are in this. It's, it's being updated, by the way. Um, that's what it's like. It's, it's reading out all the names of these people in Jerusalem who belong to God's community there. In the list may bravely read out, and let me just, this is the deal, I'm not going to read any more lists. We're not going to have, we're, um, Nehemiah chapter 12 is also a long list. We're going to give that a skip. I'm going to describe what it is next week, God willing, but we finished with long names. Um, in that list is, is really the crescendo of the whole book of Nehemiah. It's not building the walls of Jerusalem in chapter 3 that's the high point of this book. It's gathering together God's people in a community that's the crescendo and the apex and the pinnacle of the book of Nehemiah. So the chapter before us is actually the very height of the whole book of Nehemiah. Because what God is doing in history, right throughout the Bible, his big plan is to gather a group of people together under his name and for his glory. Did you know that's... If you were to ask, what's God's big plot in history? That's his big plan. It's not to draw just one person to himself over there and another little person over there uh, uh, to himself. You in your small corner and me in mine. But to gather those people into a new, living, unique diverse, loving community. That's what God was doing in the Old Testament. Uh, God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I'll make you into a great nation, not just you, but a great nation. 
And that's what God is doing in the New Testament. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2.9. So what does Paul do? As he goes around after Pentecost to all these new cities and people are converted under his preaching, does he just say, that's okay, guys, go back to your fields? No, he gathers them together into churches, small little groups who can encourage one another. Paul's purpose was not to see them converted to Christ alone, but to have them connected to one another So it's not just a she who's converted in a bakery over there and he who's converted over there uh, from his fields, but to gather brothers and sisters together in a holy community called a church. So Nehemiah 12 lists all the people who moved into Jerusalem to form this brand new living community of God's people. And that's the meaning of this chapter for us today. And we're going to glean, God willing, from this chapter of sacred scripture, at least four lessons for every new church, New Testament community of God's people, every local church, we're going to glean at least four important lessons. Number one, the church is a unique community. Number two, the church is a Bible community. Number three, the church is a diverse community. And fourthly, the church is a loving community. But can I just remind you of the story, because maybe you haven't been with us on this long journey through Nehemiah. Uh, do, you, do you remember, some of you will know, God's people had wandered away. They'd begun worshiping other idols, other gods, turning away from God. And so because God loved them, he chastised, he chastised them. If you're a true believer, then... If you wander away from him, and God, God loves you, he will chastise you. He, he will bring you back through difficulties. And um, so he chastised them at the hands of the Babylonians, who came and destroyed the, the city and, 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 and the temple and exiled the people to Babylonia, took the people away. God chastises his, pe- his people. But Because the Lord is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love, because he does not harbor his anger forever, he promised to restore them. You've gone astray, you've backslid, but because I love you, I'm going to bring you back. I've chastised you, and now I'm going to bring you back 70 years later from captivity. So they were allowed to to return to the promised land, Uh, They rebuilt the temple, that's the story of Ezra, and they've now rebuilt the city walls, that's the story of Nehemiah, Uh, but the the building of the city um, is not the apex, it's the filling of the city with people. The city walls have been built, uh, but the city is actually almost empty. Most of the 42,360 people who had returned from exile has settled in all the towns and villages surrounding Jerusalem. No wonder that the city was broken down. You wouldn't want to really live there. Now, the city was large, chapter 7, verse 4, and spacious, but there were few people living in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt, chapter 7, verse 4. The whole point of rebuilding the walls was to provide for and protect a brand new community who would come to live within the walls, The bricks and mortar weren't the end product, but the new vibrant community under God living in the city was God's great purpose. And um, this chapter has four things to teach every local church. That's us even here this morning. Number one, the church is a unique community. The people gathered in Jerusalem were the only people on the face of the earth who could call themselves the people of God. Surrounding nations could not call themselves God's people. The Persian Empire 
was not God's people. All the nations around Israel were not God's people. Only the people who gathered and were being called to live within the city were the people of God. I know it's a really simple point this morning, but it's worth us reminding that the church is abs- a totally unique community of people. Do you know that? Uh, you here, you, you and I here, we belong to all sorts of communities, don't we? Some of you belong to LinkedIn. Is that right? I see you. I happen to belong. I don't know why, but I sometimes see your name pops. Ome, your name pops up. All sorts of people, your names pop up. Okay. I get an email saying, please follow. No, I'm not going to follow them. Okay, some of you belong to LinkedIn. Many of you uh, belong to the global community called Facebook. Some of you, for some reason, belong to sports clubs, the local dog walking group, girl guides, Boy Scouts, the Women's Institute, anyone? Including our own flesh and blood families. But of every single community you belong to, if you're a Christian here this morning, there is only one community that is utterly, totally unique because God dwells within her. And they alone are God's chosen people, and that is the local church. You know, it's a great privilege to belong to their church. I I do wonder whether you and I value and rejoice in that. I, I was just uh, uh, remembered a hymn this morning. I thought I must, must just type that out because I remember this hymn. Do you know this one? I love your kingdom, Lord. I'll do it in the these and thous, okay? I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode. The church our blessed Redeemer bought with his own precious blood. I love the church, O God. Her walls before thee stand dear as the apple of your eye and graven on your hand. For her my tears shall fall. For her, the church, just talking about the church globally and our own local expression of that church, for her my prayers ascend, to her my cares and toils be given, till toils and cares shall end. Beyond my highest joy I prize her heavenly ways, her sweet communion, solemn vows, her hymns of love and praise. Sure as your truth shall last, to Zion, to the church, shall be given the brightest glories earth can yield and the brighter bliss of heaven. It's a great privilege to belong to this radically unique community. And maybe there's someone here this morning and you're saying, how can I join the church? How can I join the church? Well, we join this brand new, this wonderful, divine community by repenting of our sins and believing in the Lord Jesus. That's how we join. We repent, we turn away from the life we have been living in our own way, and we turn from our sin to God, and we believe in the good news of the gospel. And that's how we join this amazing community this unique community called the church. Number two, the church is a Bible community. We've seen that, haven't we? I'm gleaning this morning's sermon also from chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, as as well as chapter 11. In chapter 8, they read the Bible. Do you remember that? They had a big Bible festival, and they read it for hours and hours in chapter 8 with Ezra. In chapter 9, they wept over the fact that what they'd heard, they had not been obeying. So they were influenced, they were were confessing the sins. They just heard the Bible read. They were convicted by their sin. They wept over their sins. And then remember last week, they made an agreement to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our Lord. Chapter 10, verse 29. The whole Life of this community flowed out of the Bible. They were Bible people. They were a Bible community. And uh, so this is the second thing I want to say. True Christian churches are Bible communities who gather around the Word to read it, to study it, to seek, uh, to understand it, to obey it, to sing it, to pray it. The best prayers, the best songs 
are those that flow in some way out of God's Word. Let the Word of Christ, that is the Scriptures, dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another in your home groups. Let the Bible, uh, let you be filled with the Bible, the Word of Christ, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Brothers and sisters, uh, true churches are Bible churches. And as our culture drifts further away from God's Word, and we have to say with great sadness, no, no, n- no delight, no, no um, yeah, with great sadness that many of our churches are drifting from God's Word. We pray that God will keep us faithful. It's only constant diligence, isn't it? that will keep us faithful. Um, Let me give you an illustration. Um, What follows is not my own analysis. I can't remember where I got it from, but I have found this really helpful for, so could you stick with me for a few moments? Um, In the first few centuries of the church, the the, the big Bible battle was um, Christology. So, So Christology is who is Jesus Christ? And the big battle, Bible battle was Is Jesus Christ uh, God and human, or is he just divine and not really human, or just human and not really divine? That was a battle in the first few centuries. And by God's grace, the battle was won, and it was very clear from scriptures that Jesus Christ is both God and man. He has a divine nature and a human nature, both combined in one person. You can't understand it. I can't understand it, but it's wonderful. That was the battle in the first century, first few centuries. Then you go to 13th, 14th, 15th century, and the big battle is soteriology. Soteriology is how are you saved? How are you put right with God? By doing lots of religious good works, which then God puts on this balanced scale and says, yeah, you've done enough, go to heaven. Or, this is what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching, or just by believing in what God has done justification by faith alone. That's Martin Luther on the scene. And Martin Luther comes on the scene and says, we are not put right by our good works. We are put right only by faith in what God has already done for us. The gospel is spelt D-O-N-E, not D-O. That's what Martin Luther said. God has done everything, and all we must do is believe. So that was a big battle, and by God's grace, the battle was won in the 16th, 17th century. Do you know what the battle is today? The battle today in the 21st century is anthropology. What is mankind? What are you? What am I? And there are four worldly influences in the church trying to lead us away from a biblical view of mankind. There's, first of all, the species war. Are human beings just another animal, or will Bible truth win that you and I are unique creatures alone made in the image of God? Yeah, we're, we're, we're not the same as cats and dogs or chimpanzees. We've been made in the image of God, and our value rises infinitely above all the other creatures. There's a gender war going on. This is all to do with what is mankind? Are humans born with a spectrum of genders from male to female, or will the Bible truth win out, which teaches that we are born either male or female? There's a sexuality war going on, saying that sex is permissible in any human setting. Or will Bible truth win out that the only righteous place for sex is within the setting of one man and one woman married for life. There's a gender role war going on. Are men and women free to take any role they choose, or will the Bible truth win out that while men and women are absolutely created equal? Isn't that wonderful? Men and women are absolutely created equal. But there is a clear difference in role, according to Scripture, which must be seen in the church and in the home. See, our battle is not Christology or Soteriology, but our battle, I'm sorry about these big words, today is anthropology. We must remain firm 
because churches all around us are drifting. By the way, have you ever wondered why men lead our worship services here on Sunday? Some of them have had too much Weetabix for breakfast. I, I get that. <laughs> have you ever wondered why only men preach in our ga mixed gatherings? Have you wondered why men serve as elders and pastors in our church? Is it because we're sexist? Not a bit of it. It's because we somehow think men are better or more important or more gifted than women? Unthinkable. It's because we're biased against our much-loved and honored sisters. No, there's only one reason. The scriptures make it very clear that there is an order between men and women that must be observed in the church and must be practiced in the home. That's the battle we are facing today. I, I'm, not sure who's, I'm not sure we're going to win. I, I'm not sure the global church is going to win that one. But you and I, by God's grace, must do our best to fight that battle and lovingly, always lovingly, and always tactfully, and always graciously win that battle. So the church is a unique community. It's a Bible community. Thirdly, it's a diverse community. The people who came to live in Jerusalem came from many different walks of life. Provincial leaders, priests, Levites, temple servants, chief officers, supervisors. And they came from all over the place, from the towns of Judah, from the towns of Benjamin, from the north, all the way down as far as Beersheba. The population of this city, this community, was made up of a wide range of people. And when we come to the New Testament, that diversity explodes. Because let's face it, all the people in Jerusalem are all Jews. We come to the New Testament, and there is an absolute explosion of diversity. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. The church ought to be a diverse community. Uh, can I say that there, there is something wrong with a church if everyone is from the same social background, the same ethnic background, the same age group, the same educational background, the same gender, the same class. Something's wrong with a church like that. Something's wrong with a church like that. Because the gospel calls people from every single background. I heard of a recent situation in a famous London church, which is filled with just young people. Now, when I was younger, they used to call them yuppies. I think I was a yuppie once. What's a yuppie? Do you remember that phrase? Young people with uh, middle class, well-paid jobs. I think that's what it is, right? Yuppies. Well, I heard that when one of these young couples had a child, they suddenly found the church was not welcoming anymore. Wasn't cut out, wasn't, wasn't fit, wasn't ready, wasn't understanding. No provision for yuppies with kids. And I know diversity is all the rage today, but the church was in there first because Christian churches were the pioneer communities to practice true diversity where repentant people from every single background joined in, in Christ, to become one. And uh, I can't wait to heaven, because this is what it's going to be like. After this I looked, and therefore, and before me, was a great multitude that no one could count. Just from England? From every nation, tribe, people, language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, all together, this great company, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The church is a diverse community, so when we go to the coffee hall next door, look out for someone who is not like you. 
and chat to them today. Maybe that maybe that'd be a target for you today. In the world, birds of a feather flock together, don't they? Is that right? You get a certain kind of people who all go to golf clubs and a certain kind of people who belong to the knitting circle and a certain kind of people. Yeah, don't you get that? Yeah. But only in the church, birds of every single feather are mingled into one loving community. The church is unique. It's a Bible community. It's a diverse community. And finally, the church is a loving community. Because I don't know if you noticed this, but when God's people returned from exile, most of them were settled in the villages and towns around Jerusalem for decades They'd built homes, they'd cultivated fields, they'd raised their families and their livestock. Out there in the countryside, the leaders lived in Jerusalem. Now, the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem, verse 1. So how did all the, how did Nehemiah, how did God draw all those ordinary people into this new city with a new community to form this new community in Jerusalem? Well, some people volunteered. Did you see that in verse 2? Some people volunteered. The people commended all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Some people said, I'll go to Jerusalem, I'll move in, I'll move in. And then other people cast lots. So can you imagine a fist full of ten straws and one of them is shorter than the others? And you got ten, you got ten families there and you said, all of you take a straw and one in ten got the, long, the short straw, and they ended up moving into Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one in every ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city. But here's the point. Both groups, those who came voluntarily and those who had the short straws, made tremendous personal sacrifices to join this new community and live in the city. Can you imagine that? They sold their houses in the countryside. They left their fields. They left everything that maybe for up to 70, or maybe not 70 years, a number of years had been very comfortable for them. They sold it all up, rural community, and came to live in a very, very different world, an urban environment, and began to live there. They say, don't they, that moving house ranks all the way up there as one of the most stressful events in life. You heard that? Some of you know it. (laughs) Some of you have moved house recently. You know that's all about. Wow, moving house. Big, isn't it? It's really big. All these people made these sacrifices to move within the city of Jerusalem. And love for God and love for his people lay behind those sacrifices. These people loved God and they loved this new community God was calling them to and that's why they moved there. And brothers and sisters, love ought to characterize every true Christian community. Is that right? What's the mark of a Christian community? Well, love ought to be way, way, way up there. Many people comment to me on how loving Manor Park is. And if that is so, it's got nothing to do with us and everything to do with God who has poured out his love in our hearts by his Holy Spirit. And to him be the glory alone. But let's not take that love for granted, but be active in our love for one another. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Interesting that, because John is saying two things. He's saying, if you've been born of God, you automatically love. And yet, dear friends, let us love one another. Do it. It already happens, but do it. About a week ago, Stuart uh, came to me and he said, um, or maybe he went to Peter, he said, I'd like to testify on a Sunday morning to how God has has shown his love to me through the church. So I said to him, this morning, please do it. Stuart, would you like to come forward? This is unusual, isn't it? But Stuart's written something out, and I'd love him to share with you uh, what he's written. 
start. Yeah, I wrote it up so I didn't blabble. Um, <laughs> I'm very bad at that. So I want to share the encouragement that I have received from the church within the last seven months. Last September, I'd fallen on hard times, which had become very challenging for myself. And I'd like to say, sorry, about me. Um, I'd like to say the opportunity to publicly thank God for His care and provision found in the local church at Manor Park. Uh, I am very grateful to God for continuing to be there for me and um, watching over my spiritual growth by the living support of Manor Park and its leaders. I've been encouraged by taking care of my weaknesses in finances, by helping me to control them, by taking care of my practical provision through the church and for all the kindness shown through different relationships in the church. I've also been greatly encouraged by the external services in which God listed to my prayers and brings me to Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a must seed, you can say to a man, to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be mo- and it will move. Nothing is will, is will be impossible for you. I have seen a great love of Jesus Christ shine through the loving care of this church. I feel very encouraged and blessed by the care of all of the people at Manor Park Church. Through this period of my life, I've learned so much about what it means to show the love of Jesus Christ to other people. I hope to reflect this care onto others because it glorifies God. To God be the glory, and thank you, Stuart. He only knew this morning he was going to read that. So thank you, Stuart. It fitted in perfectly with uh, the theme of this morning. Um, God's people should be and are a loving community. Well, maybe you say, well, what does that look like? What does love look like? Where do you think I should go? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not eagerly angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails.